Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Goddard, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to this Institute lecture. Today our speaker is Jonathan Israel. Jonathan has been a professor in our School of Historical Studies since 2001. He took his bachelor's degree from Queen's College, Cambridge, and his doctorate from St. Anthony's College, Oxford. He taught at the University of Hull in the UK from 1972 to 1974, and then he joined the faculty of University College London, where he served as professor of Dutch history and institutions from 1985 until he moved to join the Institute. Jonathan's work is concerned with European and European colonial history from the Renaissance to the 18th century. In particular, in recent years, he's been concerned with the impact of radical thought on the Enlightenment. He's concerned with the influence of Spinoza, Diderot, and the 18th century French materialists on the emergence of the modern ideas of democracy, equality, toleration, freedom of the press, and individual freedom. Jonathan became a fellow of the British Academy in 1992 and a corresponding fellow of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, um, and he was also made a, a Knight of the Order of the Dutch Lion in 2004. His distinction has been recognized by the award of very many prizes, as well as honorary doctorates from the universities of Antwerp and Rotterdam, and an honorary professorship from the University of Amsterdam. At the end of Jonathan's lecture, there'll be an opportunity for questions, and the lecture will be followed by a reception in the Ford Hall Common Room, to which you're all invited. And as you can see today, Jonathan's title is Celebrating Modern Democracy's Beginnings, the British Club in Rome. Jonathan. In Paris. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Before the terror, which began in the autumn of 1793, the French Revolution was generally viewed extremely positively by American, British, and Irish, and other foreign intellectuals, writers, Democrats, and progressive constitutional thinkers and law reformers. Among the foremost expressions of admiration for the universal values of human rights, equality, and democracy proclaimed by the early French Revolution, by which I mean roughly 1788 to 93, before Robespierre's takeover, were the, among the foremost expressions of admiration were the gatherings of the British Club, or what in effect was an Anglo-American salon of supporters of democracy and human rights gathering in Paris uh, through 1792 and the first half of 1793. A topic of considerable significance, which rather amazingly has been very little studied or discussed. At the great banquet at the British Club in Paris, held on the 18th of November 1792, which is the central theme of, uh, of my talk this evening, more than 100 distinguished Anglo-American Democrats, including Tom Paine, David Williams, Joel Barlow, Eliezer Oswald, John Oswald, Helen Maria Williams, and Lord Edward Fitzgerald, gathered to celebrate liberty, human rights, and the spread of democracy across the world, or what they viewed as the assured democratic future of mankind. Mary Wollstonecraft, who arrived, arrived and stayed at the hotel where the banquet was held shortly afterwards, and several other founders of modern feminism were an integral part of this movement. The American Revolution between 1776 and 1783 and the American Constitution were, of course, a great inspiration for all Europe and the rest of the world. But the United States was not a democracy, of course, until the 1830s, even for adult white men, let alone blacks and women. And originally, in the late 18th century, uh, after the revolution, none of the state constitutions uh, were democratic, except very briefly that of Pennsylvania for a few years during, during the revolution. 
Britain in the 18th century was, of course, even further from being a modern democracy than the United States, being basically uh, an aristocratic society. That's what it was, in which power and office were overwhelmingly dominated by the gentry and nobility. The right to vote in parliamentary elections was restricted to a relatively small part of the population, basically those with considerable property and substantial incomes. A census in 1780, when Britain's population stood at 8 million, reveals that just 214,000 adult men had the vote. That's less than 3% of the total population. So you see how it happened that between 1789 and the advent of Robespierre and the Terror in the autumn of 1793, France could be and was a unique as well as tremendous inspiration for all the most aware and progressive intellectuals and Democrats on both sides of the Atlantic. France, in effect, from 1792 uh, till the Robespierre takeover, always that qualification, was the modern world's first democracy, one in which all adult men had the right to vote and at the same time was the first society to adopt a comprehensive charter of human rights. Uh, the original Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, there it is, of 1789, had uh, uh, 17 articles. They expanded on this uh, later in 1793, the spring of 1793, and uh, <laughs> expanded it to 35 basic human rights. But the essential principles and concepts uh, were hammered out during uh, the summer of 1789. At the same time, France, until the autumn of 1793, was the first country to adopt full freedom of the press. Uh, by the way, that's very impressive. There are more than 50 uh, dailies in Paris by the summer of 1789 and through the early years of the revolution. And this is fascinating and very, very lively reading, tremendously impressive. There had never been anything like that before in the history of the world. So when I say freedom of the press, I mean something tremendously new and tremendously impressive. Freedom of the press, freedom of the theatre. Remember, in England in the 18th century, you have, let's say, semi freedom of the press, but absolutely no freedom of the theatre. That was very strictly controlled, was considered very uh, capable of causing considerable disturbance. So full freedom of expression in theatre, that's something totally new, which you don't see in history before this. So I, I want to emphasise this because we are talking about something immensely different from what you would see in England in the late 18th century, uh, something that uh, was entirely and dramatically new for contemporaries. Uh, then, of course, uh, freedom to hold political meetings, as well as the uh, being the first uh, modern state to abolish uh, all forms of serfdom, and then black slavery in principle in 1793-4, and the first to remove all religious disabilities from every religious minority, Jews, Unitarians, Mennonites, Deists, there, there, there are no, no disabilities of any kind. Uh, yet, Yet, the fact that modern democracy first emerged in France in the years between 1788 and 93 has never been much emphasized by historians or philosophers or political scientists, or anyone else for that matter, in America, in Britain, or even France, understandably perhaps, because it was so quickly reversed and overshadowed by the terrible events of the terror beginning in September 1793. Uh, the terror went on until... Uh, till the autumn of 1794. So this, the, 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 the neglect and uh, absence of any emphasis on this tremendous, tremendous landmark in human history is understandable, but also very misleading. Uh, of course, Robespierre, once Robespierre, there he is, secured power, uh, the change was immediate and very dramatic indeed. The Constitution of 1793 was immediately suspended. Liberty of the press and theater, not just suppressed, but completely suppressed. All human rights were grotesquely violated. But this happened because the men who made the revolution of 1788-93 were swept aside, all of them, without any exceptions, all swept aside, and a whole new ideology took over, one presenting uh, a vision of the people as uh, uh, this <laughs> a slightly amusing, uh, or grotesque rather, um, 
a print of uh, Robespierre having guillotined everybody else is now guillotining the executioner. Um, once uh, this whole new ideology took it over, um, a central, I don't want to speak too much about the differences between what I call the uh, true Republicans who created the, the world's first modern democracy and the Robespierreist ideology, but one of the crucial differences is the idea that uh, the way the ordinary person thinks, which is what Robespierreism stands for, the ordinary man, uh, is something collective and unitary. It's indivisible. So there it is. The, the people is a colossus. There's no division of opinion. And what's more, you don't permit any dissent. So here's the colossus, the people making mincemeat. It says up there, uh, le peuple mangeur de roi, um, sweeping aside these puny, feeble kings who've dominated all politics hitherto. Uh, so it, this was an ideology, a new ideology, a very different ideology from the ideology that created the revolution and one that led to tens of, and eventually hundreds of thousands being imprisoned without trial and many thousands being guillotined, shot or otherwise murdered by the state. This abrupt change of direction has so totally colored our view of the revolution that we tend to forget much of what happened before. Um, but this cannot alter the crucial fact that uh, and here we see, this is the Constitution of uh, 1793, uh, symbolized um, in a print, and what it's based on is la sagesse, the wisdom of the Enlightenment and the immutable rights of man, and it was indeed the world's first democratic constitution drawn up, hammered out over months in the later part of 1792 and the first months of 1793, uh, then uh, slightly altered after the Robespierreist came to power in June 1793, put to the whole uh, male adult vo voting population of France in a referendum and endorsed and enforced for a few weeks and then, as I say, uh, wholly suspended by Robespierre. Well, once the terror began, it became much easier for the revolution's innumerable enemies, foreign and domestic, to disparage and ridicule as deluded men of abysmal judgment, all British writers and public figures who had publicly endorsed the revolution, the most eminent of whom was uh, Tom Paine, of course, with his uh, well-celebrated book championing the revolution, The Rights of Man of 1790, which came out in an, in an extraordinary number of editions all over the place. Uh, here's a title page from Dublin in 1789. There were editions in North America, in, in England, in Scotland, in, in Holland, and uh, in, in various languages in all sorts of other places. Uh, and among the... Uh, American radical thinkers who thought that the American Revolution hadn't gone far enough and should the American Revolution was not democratic but should have been democratic in the view of radicals who've not actually been made too much of. One of them was Joel Barlow. They're not terribly well known. That's a point that I'll come back to uh, later. Barlow was an, uh, a poet um, whose <laughs> vast epic poem puts forward uh, a rather amazing vision um, it's called the vision of Columbus, a rather amazing vision of uh, modernity and the future of humanity on both sides of the Atlantic, but it's largely forgotten now. Um, so, uh, as I've been suggesting, the idea that the revolution was a single unilinear development from a single set of ideas or doctrines and that uh, Robespierre and the Robespierreis was somehow the fulfillment of the revolution and the fulfillment of the idea of liberty of the whole uh, Enlightenment, as many thinkers, many postmodernists, and many critics of the Enlightenment, all sorts of writers say this still today. Uh, from what I've said so far, you can see that that's nonsense historically, but it's also very, very useful nonsense because anybody that wants to reject the principles of the Enlightenment, uh, and this goes all the way back to uh, 1793, 1794, principles of the Enlightenment, especially the democratic or radical Enlightenment, uh, and wants to uh, express hostility to the revolution and ridicule the revolution can very easily do so by saying, well, look at the terrible Robespierre and the terror, that was the culmination of the revolution. 
when in fact it was the undoing of the revolution and the complete opposite to the revolution, as, it, as all the Democrats I'm talking about this evening uh, agreed. Well, um, Robespierre repeated tirelessly that he was against the philosophers, he hated the philosophers, he rejected the work of the philosophers. We don't need all that philosophy, was his battle cry of the people who had made the revolution. It's the ordinary person, how the ordinary person feels that is paramount. That's the only criterion of legitimacy. The people alone is good, pure, and uncorrupted. And I, Robespierre, represent the people. Furthermore, there's only one way the really ordinary person thinks, only one authentically popular view, and therefore only one correct opinion about things, and all dissent will be crushed. That's the Robespierre's ideology. What occurred was a, a desperate struggle between rival ideologies, and it's the libertarian ideology of the radical enlightenment with its claim that ignorance is the real enemy. That's nicely symbolized in this print. So uh, whilst they were still on top in 1792 and 1793, they could put forward this message quite effectively, the, the, the left Republican Democrats, who were in power in 1792 and early 1793, uh, what liberty is, is something that upholds uh, reason and enlightenment. So there is the uh, scepter of reason and enlightenment, destroying um, ignorance and fanaticism. And you can't have liberty whilst ignorance and fanaticism dominate. So you've got to destroy <laughs> ignorance, or you, at least you've got to overwhelm uh, in considerable degree, ignorance and fanaticism have to be weakened or you can't have any liberty. True enough, surely. The group upholding the democratic ideology uh, initiated by uh, Mirabeau, Brissot, uh, the great philosophe uh, Condorcet, uh, who was also one of the central personalities of this group during the early part of the revolution, this was the bloc that introduced the principles of human rights and representative parliamentary democracy for the first time in modern history, along with the freedom of the press and expression and the other freedoms that went with it. Not the least of which was the idea of the emancipation of women, uh, which is an absolutely crucial theme in the early part of the revolution. So when, when our Republican Democrats are running things, the discussion about the emancipation of women is a very important integral element in the revolution. The moment the Robespierre's take over, that's finished, because nobody in the Robespierre's bloc is the slightest bit interested in improving the position of women in relation to men. That is a completely different thing. As I'm saying, these two ideologies are totally different, and anybody that sees the one as the culmination of the other is extremely confused, historically and philosophically. So we won't, we will try to avoid that confusion, <laughs> I hope, in the rest of uh, this discussion. Now, uh, four, here you see four of the leading ladies of the movement to uh, initiate emancipation of women. Uh, Condorcet's wife, Sophie de Condorcet, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, of course, um, uh, Alain de Gouges, who is such a central and interesting figure in the revolution, much less well-known but very important, is the Dutch lady who had been living in Paris since the 1770s, uh, Etta Palm. Um, now, uh, so you have this group uh, in France, but we, we should also say that uh, not, it's not just Mary Wollstonecraft, that this feminist movement had a considerable representation in Paris, in this British club that I'm going to focus on, uh, in the shape of Helen Maria Williams, uh, Charlotte Smith, uh, and a number of others, actually, who, who formed a core element in what came to be uh, which, which was, uh, by early 1792, uh, called the British Club in Paris. All these remarkable women promoted the idea that women should and must be emancipated from their subordinate position to men. Uh, Etta Palm Dalders, um, who uh, in, in March 1791 set up the first ever modern women's political organization, Les Amis de la Verité. Um, uh, Alain de Gouge, who was perhaps, well, they were all courageous and brave, and they all took considerable risks, but none more so than Alain de Gouge. When Robespierre and his friends managed to mislead enough people to topple the Brissotin, uh, and large numbers were, began to be arrested in September 1793, um, Alain de Gouge uh, 
uh, was one of the first actually arrested and one of the first guillotined together with Brissot and Pétion for her criticism of Robespierre and for many remarks she'd made about the group that he led. Um, she um, She believed that, and Helen Maria Williams and some of the others saw the same thing, that even a couple of years before the Robespierre takeover, you could see what it would mean if that rival bloc did succeed in, in, in capturing power. Helen Maria Williams, early in 1793, called the Robespierreist conspirators and traitors to their nation. A lamp de gauche called uh, Marat, who was a kind of herald and or John the Baptist almost, if, if that's not too grotesque a comparison to um, Robespierre, the, the man that announced him and cleared the path for him. Um, she, Alain de Gouge, called Marat a destroyer of the laws and mortal enemy of order, humanity, and his country, a tyrant and a plague. Uh, Marat uh, I should actually be, uh, excuse me, I've got this slightly out of order, but le let's just go back to Alain de Gouge for a moment as a woman who, as a critic of the Declaration of the Rights of Man, uh, which I put on, on the screen as the first slide. So um, I've set out there the first four of the clauses of the Declaration of the Rights of Man of 1789, and uh, she was brave enough to draw, draw up a somewhat ironic but deadly serious critique of the 1789 rights, setting them out as, uh, and, pre and actually presenting them to the assembly. Of course, they were rejected by the vast majority who refused to take such a thing seriously. Um, but in the, among the leading group, among the group around Brissot and uh, Condorcet and Tom Paine and so on, what she had to say was taken very seriously. So I won't read it all out, but you see how uh, her, just from the first four, how each of them in a critical way refers to each of the others. The fourth is interesting. Liberty and justice consist of restoring all that belongs to any, to all. Thus, the only limits on the exercise of the natural rights of women are perpetual male tyranny. These limits are to be reformed by the laws of nature and reason. And she drew up her, her um, a Declaration of Rights of Women of 1791, uh, precisely in 17 clauses, so as to make it very clear that what she was doing was echoing and criticizing at the same time the Declaration of the Rights of Man. She uh, was one of the severest critics of uh, Marat and uh, of, uh, as she was also of uh, Robespierre. And uh, if they were all scoundrels in her eyes, uh, Marat at least was not uh, a hypocrite. Uh, he'd been saying for a couple of years before the, the populist authoritarian bloc took over power that what the French really needed was to cut off 200,000 heads and a dictatorship, and Robespierre should be the dictator. He'd been making this quite clear for a long time that if this group took power, that's what's going to happen. And... Um, she, a, a very brave lady called Charlotte Cordois, assassinated him in the bath in July 1793, in his bath, I should say. Um, <laughs> if anyone ever deserved being stabbed to death in the bath, it was surely Marat, who was a thoroughly obnoxious character. Uh, anyway, um, Olympe, Olympe de Gouges predicted that Robespierre was so bad that one could be sure that were he to succeed, as soon as he uh, captured power, that he would revenge himself on the Democratic Republicans, and not just revenge himself, that he would assassinate Condorcet, Brissot, Pétion, and the others who had made the revolution, a remarkably correct prediction. Although she didn't know that she's going, she was going to be one of the ones guillotined among the first along with them. Once one sees that the Republican Democrats shaping the revolution between 1788 and 1793, and who introduced the rights of man, abolished feudalism, abolished aristocracy, ended serfdom, and established democracy, uh, as well as initiated modern feminism, that this group had really nothing to do with Robespierre and the terror, or the anti-feminism of 1793 to 4, it becomes much clearer how it was that many of the best British, American, and Irish Democrats and Republicans were so wildly enthusiastic 
enthusiastic about the revolution in its early stages, that is, until Robespierre's coup d'etat. The universal and distinctly euphoric terms in which the leading British, Irish, and American Democrats celebrated the new democracy and the beginnings of universal human liberation, universal democracy and human rights, and even the distant promise of universal peace among men starts to make much more sense when we see it in this light, and I want to illustrate it this evening by focusing on this banquet. Now, by late 1791, the French quasi-republic, it wasn't formally a republic till uh, August 1792, but it, the king uh, had no power and it was uh, a very detailed constitution in place by late, late 1791. Um, the the, the quasi-republic found itself at war with the Austrian Empire and Prussia and other European states uh, supported by Britain and Prussia. Uh, and these enemies were trying to invade France and destroy the revolution, which of course threatened all kings and, and all, the, all the traditional uh, societies of uh, Europe and beyond. So the occasion that I'm making the centerpiece of, of this talk, um, take, which took place, as I say, on the 18th of November 1792, was um, the pretext was to celebrate the French victory at the um, Battle of Jemap, which you see there, a, a later picture from 1821, that's the Battle of Jemap. Uh, the, fr the, in the early months of the Revolutionary Wars, the, um, fr France was invaded and was very much on the defensive, but they began to have more success uh, in the autumn of 1792, and the Battle of Jemap was the first major French victory outside of France's borders. In, in fact, the battle that led to the complete overrunning of Belgium in November 1792. So this is key battle, won by General uh, Dumouriez, who you see there. And this was the first time non-professional volunteers defeated a highly professional army, mostly Austrian, um, or ha Austrian Habsburg Imperial Army, very professional. Uh, but why, you might well ask, should the British, Americans, and Irish re resident in Paris meet on the 18th of November, 1792, under the banner of the Friends of the Rights of Man, associated at Paris, known as the British Club, at White's Hotel, which was also known as the Hotel d'Angleterre, which a few months later, after the outbreak of the war with Britain, uh, had to be renamed the uh, Hotel de Philadelphie, uh, to... Why would they meet in this way to participate in the grandest and most important banquet celebrating French achievements that Anglo-Americans ever mounted in France before the 20th century? It was a huge occasion. Uh, why would they do this to celebrate France uh, overrunning Belgium? And what is more, only two months, only two months before the outbreak of war between Britain and revolutionary France, a war already long brewing because of extremely bad, by this time, extremely bad relations between Britain and France. Only when we view the occasion in the context of universal human emancipation, human rights and democracy, as I've tried to describe, can we understand the symbolism, emotion, enthusiasm, and significance of this extraordinary event. Now, according to uh, contemporary French press reports, those attending, Payne and Barlow among them, numbered well over 100. But the few modern historians who've discussed this grand occasion under the spell of traditional uh, British, and uh, only one or two British historians, because no one else seems to have discussed it, um, under the spell of traditional notions about patriotism, have been so shocked by reports that numerous distinguished British should have uh, been engaged in something that at the time and long afterwards was represented in England as profoundly un-British and unpatriotic. Uh, the two or three writers that have written about this refuse to believe that there can have been anything like 100. One of them says they can't have been more than 80. Um, that's uh, Albert Goodwin in his book, The Friends of Liberty, the English Democratic Movement in the Age of the French Revolution, 1979. He didn't think that many true English could possibly have been there. I, I just quote so that you can get something of the flavor of his reaction. How can, they, how can these people... Uh, these militant, I'm quoting now, militant enthusiasts be prepared to dabble in treason in collusion with the French on the eve and even after the outbreak of war. And he conjectured that these traitors, as he calls them, must have, surely most of them were really Americans, Irish, or else Scottish. Uh, 
But this is certainly wrong. All the contemporary reports show that there were over 100 present at the banquet, and most were unquestionably English, even if there were numerous eminent Scots, Irish, and Americans present. But the main point is that they were not traitors, but radical Enlightenment enthusiasts for democracy, emancipation of peoples, and human rights. And it's important that we understand and appreciate their thoughts and their efforts. Their overriding aim was to see democracy for freedom of the press and expression and human rights firmly established in Britain too. If there had to be a war with Britain, which most of them dreaded, they wanted the convention to declare war solely on the British crown and on the British aristocracy and not on what they called the, th the three nations of Britain. Now we're going to go through the banquet's 16 toasts, one by one. I'm doing this partly to get you thirsty for the reception later, and partly to give the flavor of this extraordinary event and help explain its significance. So uh, on this, this date, 18th of November, 1792, the, the Anglo-Americans and Irish in Paris gathered at White's to acclaim the French victories, celebrate the triumph of liberty, and draw up an address to the French National Convention which was actually presented 10 days later on the 28th of November. They did this under the presidency of John Herford Stone, uh, from whom no portrait survives, it seems, a former London coal merchant, originally from uh, Somerset, a friend of Joseph Priestley and uh, Richard Price. Uh, in Paris, Herford Stone ran a chemical works and had a printing press uh, producing materialist, anti-theological, and pro-revolution writings by Paine, uh, Volney and others in both French and English, including uh, later in 1793 the Paris edition of um, Joel Barlow's um, American Republican epic, which I've referred to already, The Vision of Columbus, um, a rather huge and amazing text, now very largely forgotten. Um, Stone was a long-standing opponent of Pitt's policies. He hoped to assist France in keeping Britain from directly entering the European struggle against her. He was to remain in France through much of the terror, and after a spell in Switzerland, returned to Paris in 1794, and he spent the rest of his life there. He couldn't return to Britain for political reasons. Besides Herford Stone, present were uh, Tom Paine, Joel Barlow, the Welsh Unitarian and Democrat David Williams, the eccentric Scots vegetarian opponent of Edmund Burke and egalitarian Colonel John Oswald, who had served in India, uh, the poet Robert Merry, the American Colonel Eliezer Oswald, who was shortly to command part of the French artillery in Belgium, and um, Helen Maria Williams. Now, uh, David Williams, who, um, this is a, a, a very nice memorial to him in, in Wales at Carnarvon, Welsh Unitarian uh, Democrat, uh, had stated many times, um, as in his, uh, uh, as in, uh, sorry, had stated many times that um, the British Constitution as it had been remodeled and remade by the glorious revolution of 1688, uh, and which most people in Britain in the 18th century were very proud of, was something quite inadequate for um, the uh, new dawning age. And he put forward his plan for an equal representation of the people of England, he said England needed a democratic constitution. It's not widely remembered today. Um, and uh, well, forgive me for making a slightly cynical comment, but the, the fact that figures like David Williams are so forgotten when they were actually heroic fighters for democracy in the late 18th century when we didn't have anything may have a, a wider general cultural significance. If we forget the heroic struggles of the Democrats that fought uh, for democracy, is there not something convenient in that because it makes it easier for everybody to forget that Britain and the United States were very far from being uh, anything remotely like uh, democratic societies in the late 18th century. Anyhow, the democratic views of those present represented a stark contrast with the thoughts of the vast majority 
of the British class, upper classes, and that's what Edward Gibbon is doing there. Uh, he, Eben, Edward Gibbon was spending this period uh, at his house in Lausanne uh, in French Switzerland, so he's just over the French border. He's very close to these events and was absolutely obsessed by them. There are fascinating comments in his uh, autobiographical notes about what's going on. So he's anxiously scrutinizing the French scene from nearby Lausanne. And uh, just to give uh, uh, a quote which gives something of the flavor of his remarks, if England, he says in a letter penned just one week before the banquet I'm describing, if England, the last refuge of liberty and law, as he called it, should, with the experience of our happiness and French calamities, now be seduced to eat the apple of false freedom, meaning democratic ideas, the sort of thing David Williams was presenting and Priestley, um, we should indeed deserve to be driven from the paradise which we enjoy. I turn aside from the horrid and improbable, yet not impossible, supposition that in three or four years' time, myself and my best friends may be reduced to the deplorable state of the French émigrés. They, after all, thought it as impossible three or four years ago. Since what was happening in Europe was of such immense significance for the happiness of the human race, in their opinion, uh, Herford Stone and his fellow organizers invited delegations from all the other principal nations. Music was provided by the Paris band of the Légion, uh, Légion Germanique. The banquet began early, and the high point of the day came when all stood and in turn drank the following toast. One, to the French Republic embodying the rights of man. Here the trumpets of the German band played the famous revolutionary tune, Ça ira. Two, to the armies of France. May the example of her, her citizen soldiers be followed by all enslaved nations until all tyranny and all tyrants are destroyed. And at this point, the German band played the uh, Marseillaise. Remember, the Marseillaise had only been composed um, a, a year or so before, was very new. It hadn't yet been proclaimed the national anthem of France. But it, even more than Saïra, it, 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 it made a breakthrough. It's extraordinary how very popular it became. It, be it was really the song of the revolution. Uh, by the autumn in 1792, and some uh, reports say it was actually decisive in the Battle of Jemap. I didn't say this when I mentioned the Battle of Jemap, but it began very badly for the French. They were very disorganized and unprofessional, so the professional Austrians were driving them back, and they were considerably uh, in great disarray, <laughs> and de Maurier, who was a, a good soldier, but was, didn't really know what to do with this disorganized mass, and he only had a few minutes to <laughs> decide on something. So he told the people around him, let's sing the Marseillaise. Uh, so they began singing, and soon the whole, all 40,000 of the French stopped running or retreating, <laughs> and they were all singing the Marseillaise. And of course, the Austrian troops were definitely not used to this and were so astounded that they, they stopped and turned around, and before, in the, within a few minutes, it was a rout. So the Marseillaise actually won the Battle of Chimap, so nothing could have been more appropriate. Three, to the achievements of the National Convention of France. Four, there you see four, five, and six, to the coming Constitutional Convention of Britain and Ireland. So here you see the, uh, the, the subversive aspect is obvious with the clear implication that Britain uh, too needed a new and democratic constitution and this would eventually be obtained. Five, to the perpetual union of the peoples of Britain, France, America, and the Netherlands, and may these also soon bring other emancipated nations into their democratic alliance. Six, to the prompt abolition in Britain of all hereditary titles and all feudal distinctions. Now, this rousing toast was proposed by Sir Robert Smythe, former MP for Colchester, and uh, Lord, Edward, uh, Lord Edward Fitzgerald, who you see there, an interesting character, a dashing Irish noble, a major in the British Army, also a friend of Tom Paine, and uh, an MP also for the Irish constituency of Kildare. Once uh, war with Britain broke out in February 1793, um, Fitzgerald, who afterwards became a leader in the United Irishman conspiracy of 1796 to 8, actively plotted collusion with the French and an invasion of Ireland or, or, and Britain too, um, and was uh, in fact 
plotting the whole time in, in the later 1790s until uh, he, he was in Dublin in 1798. He was killed when um, British officers broke into his lodgings in Dublin trying to arrest him. He drew his pistols and there was a, an affray and he was killed. Um, so uh, that's a rather amazing toast. Uh, you see in this print in, in, in June 1790, uh, it, it is an amazing thing that it was considered to be necessary and integral to the, any proper conception of democracy and um, equality that uh, not only should titles of nobility be declared invalid, and a lot were burnt. This is a bonfire in which titles, titre de noblesse, are being thrown on the bonfire and destroyed. There were a lot of bonfires in which titles of nobility were destroyed, 1790 and 91. And uh, the, the, uh, in the clarification of that edict, it was actually forbidden in France, in municipal government, in, uh, for, for mayors, in any kind of administrative or public role, local, regional, or whatever, you were not allowed to use um, public titles or titles of distinction after 1790. So toast six for the abolition of all aristocratic titles at this banquet was particularly dramatic because Smythe, and Fitzgerald, there and then, at the banquet itself, in a, uh, a vivid gesture, both renounced their titles. And this repudiation of aristocracy was quickly reported in the British papers not long afterwards, uh, which led to Smythe becoming an outcast and Fitzgerald immediately being cashiered from the British army. The seventh toast was to... Uh, the ladies of Britain and Ireland, and especially those distinguished by their writings on behalf of the French Revolution. And at that point, were read out th uh, three names, those of Charlotte Smith, uh, who was, um, there she is on, on the left, who was uh, well known for her novel, um, um, uh, her, her main pre-revolutionary novel, it's called Desmond, 1792, um, appeared just around this time, actually, and it expressed her, her faith in Enlightenment and the Revolution, though she changed her view later. Uh, Helen Maria Williams, um, one or two others were mentioned, Miss V. M. Trillamont. I've not been able to find out anything about her. But he Helen Maria Williams was certainly, uh, she's the lady on the right here, sorry, um, was certainly a very interesting personality, though largely forgotten now. Uh, half Scottish and half Welsh. Uh, she was about 30 at this time. She was, in fact, Stone's lover and helped preside over the British club in Paris in its role as a kind of revolutionary, universal democratic salon, uh, much frequented by the Brissot circle, as well as by the English and Americans. Uh, she'd been in Paris since July 1790 and uh, was to emerge through her various volumes of letters and essays on the revolution as possibly the single most important writer supporting the revolution in English. And uh, her, her letters from France were one of the texts that most expressed this uh, admiration and this uh, support for the revolution. Here you see a characteristic passage uh, from volume two where she expresses her pleasure that they've been changing all the street names in Paris, not, not the least interesting feature, the fascinating feature of the revolution. So suddenly you have the Quai de Voltaire, uh, Voltaire the street of Rousseau, Mirabeau, etc. Uh, why is no street or square in London named after Pope Milton or to rise to the highest climax of human genius after Shakespeare? That's how she spells Shakespeare, with no, no E. Um, well, this, this toast was obviously part of the general feminist movement integral to the uh, Parti de Philosophie, who had been running the revolution, and to the plans of Condorcet and Brissot. But of course, these ladies were not only scorned in Britain, but also regarded negatively and derided by most of the French press and the vast majority of French society at the time. Uh, the... Um, Here uh, we see um, a theme which was to figure in the next of the, the toasts. I've arrived at, uh, um, I've lost count for the moment. But anyway, this is the, next, the toast after the, the, the toast for the ladies of Britain, that was the seventh. So this is the eighth toast, uh, was for the ladies of France, or France, there you see the Française devenue libre. Um, 
And in toast eight, every, everyone rose and, and toasted to, to the, uh, especially to Mademoiselle Anselme and Thurnick. These were two sister officers, actually, in uh, de Maurier's entourage after whom uh, militant revolutionary women later in 1793 in France proposed forming a female army contingent to be called the Thurnig Corps. Very few men, were of, co of course, were willing to take the idea of women's army units seriously at this time. But John Oswald, the Scots colonel uh, at the banquet, figured among those who, who, who um, uh, energetically supported the idea of using women's contingents and, and more generally had many suggestions to make regarding the tactics and formation of what was, was the world's first democratic army. Toast 9 to the, was to the defenders of the rights of man who by their uh, writings formed the avant-garde of the Republic's victories. A very interesting way of expressing the point. Uh, then you get this uh, list of names, uh, Condorcet, Briso, Cies, Caracas, and Louvet, Gorsas, Oda. What this shows is that they very clearly saw that the people that made the revolution and established its principles were the heirs of what we call the, or what's sometimes called now the radical enlightenment philosophs. And it's interesting that Condorcet's name is, is placed first. Uh, but also, uh, it's a list that's stressing the role of key newspaper editors. Uh, Cara, Gossas, Louvé, also Brissot and Condorcet were editors of uh, major revolutionary papers. And I think nothing was more important. If you look at the pro-revolutionary press, of course, the royalist press was allowed, even the ultra-royalist press, nobody interfered with that until 1793, as I say. There was complete freedom of the press. But the pro-revolution press uh, was very impressive. And the quality press, uh, all the good papers, um, supported uh, the democratic republicans and the only papers that support the Robespierre the Robespierre's block in 1793, uh, two to three, are uh, what in Britain today is called the gutter press. It, there's a, a very low populist press using lots of uh, swearing and cursings and uh, so on. Uh, extremely simplistic and very boring to read, I assure you. Uh, like uh, Marat's paper, uh, L'Ami du Peuple, uh, th those were the kind of papers that supported the Robespierre. But none of the uh, more aware and intelligent papers do. Every single, no exceptions, everyone supports the, what I call the Democratic Republicans. Okay, um, so this, this Toast 9 is really very interesting, uh, making uh, the link both with radical enlightenment and with the s crucial role of the quality press in the making of the, of the revolution. And speaking of the newspaper editors and the role of the uh, quality press in the, <laughs> in the revolution, I, I should, um, or before I come to the quality press, just another word about, about the Enlightenment, of course, these, since they put so much stress on Enlightenment, these democratic republicans, they'd uh, turn the, um, sorry, the uh, pantheon in Paris, they, you see it into a kind of uh, mausoleum for the great thinkers. They were thinking of bringing Descartes there. They hadn't actually brought Descartes' remains into the pantheon. There was a lot of discussion about putting Rousseau there, but they didn't get around to that till later. But so far, um, at this early point in the revolution in 1791, they had installed the remains amid unbelievable ceremonies, which went on all day. It was a huge thing, which, which affected the whole of Paris. Uh, Voltaire had been installed, and so had uh, Mirabeau. It was a little bit of a slate of hand to include Voltaire amongst the, those that had prepared the revolution, because Voltaire, of course, was an admirer of kings and courts. So they were twisting things a bit, but they had to, they had to resort to this device because uh, Vol Voltaire was the most famous of all the philosophers, for one thing, and apart from Rousseau, and for another thing, he was, after all, the one who had begun the protests against uh, the movement, against intolerance, against narrow-mindedness, against censorship, against bigotry, against excessive religious authority, and so on. So here uh, you see uh, monarchy in the shape of uh, Louis XVI being um, th uh, thrown over with a very irreverent gesture there, referring to the... Uh, the king's attempted flight on the 21st of June, 1791. 
Um, and uh, Voltaire, the immortal man, is now uh, a much more substantial uh, force in the life of the nation than this uh, discredited king. And he, uh, this is Voltaire's remains being brought to the Pantheon. And au grand homme, la patrie reconnaissante, uh, of course, that's still there on the Pantheon today, and it is still today um, a, a mausoleum for France's great men. Uh, toast 10, that was to the generals, de Maurier, Costine, and the others. Toast 11, to the local patriotic societies in France and in England. And remember, in England, there were democratic and radical societies, not only in London, but in Manchester and Birmingham and other places, which were very unpopular and were heaped with abuse by the newspapers and by most of the public. But, there were, uh, there, but the Democrats were determined to uh, stand up and be counted and to support the revolution, and they were certainly there. There were also now these societies in Belgium. Toast 12, uh, everybody stood up to uh, toast Thomas Paine and what Herford Stone humorously called um, his novel method of... Now, they got them slightly out of order. This is now coming back to uh, the newspaper editors. This is just a print illustrating in 1791... Um, <laughs> the, 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 only, the only populist paper mentioned here is Marat's paper, L'Ami du Peuple. I don't know why he's buried with just a hand holding it up. But the others, the, there's Brissot, there's Gorsas. The others, these are all the quality press supporting the Democratic Republicans. And all these papers, except for that one, um, that's, uh, this one is Desmoulins' paper. He, he was, of course, a very important figure. Not, not one of the Brissotins, one of the Dantonistes, but very much an heir of the radical enlightenment as well, as he says on many, many occasions. Um, so these are all the, um, these are all the pro-revolution papers, quality papers. Uh, so all rose toast 12 and 13 to toast Thomas Paine and what Stone humorously called his novel method of making good books known to the public via royal prohibitions and prosecution of authors, uh, alluding of course to the vigorous way the British government was suppressing the rights of man. Uh, 13 to all the other patriots of England who by their writings and speeches have contributed to propagating the principles of the revolution. And here we get an interesting list of names, Priestley, Price, Sheridan, Barlow, Cooper, Took, and Mackintosh. Now, um, Priestley, of course, was uh, perhaps the most famous, the uh, Unitarian preacher, but a, a leading scientist, philosopher, democratic publicist. Uh, there he is. Uh, he, his house and his uh, very, well, uh, um, very well supplied scientific laboratory in Birmingham were all wrecked and smashed to pieces by uh, a raging church and uh, king mob in 1791. Actually, he was lucky to survive. He would have been killed if friends hadn't got him out of the house in time. He, he through his support for the revolution and through his democratic um, uh, public, uh, publicizing. He did make himself extremely unpopular. Uh, Richard Price was internationally known, of course, uh, again, a Welshman, very, um, uh, I mean, like David Williams, not like Priestley, but Price was a Welshman. Um, he, he died in 1791, so he couldn't be uh, at the banquet, but he was certainly celebrated in no uncertain terms. And um, uh, Sheridan and, uh, of course, was one of the leading Whig politicians in, 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 in Parliament. Thomas Cooper was the leader of the Radical Reform Society in, in, in Manchester. Now, uh, one of the forms that the... There were many attacks in England on these people, and Priestley, I think, got more than his fair share, probably. This, this, this caricature, uh, in his, in his uh, writings, Priestley was attacking ignorance and superstition almost as much as the French philosophes. So this is a, a joke about his constant denunciation of superstition. The congregation are asking him whether the devil exists, and he says, shouts no, and there's the devil poking him in the backside at that moment. Um, and uh, here's a caricature. Now, the, the, the in, there was talk of the possibility of a French invasion. So uh, de Maurier is represented in this horrific guise here um, by the spring of 1793. And uh, the idea of this Gilray um, caricature is that the 
democratic radicals in England who had supported, had been supporting the French Revolution were in fact traitors who were betraying their country. Uh, and that there is uh, Fox handing over the head of the Prime Minister Pitt to Du Maurier, who wants to gobble up everything in his path. Uh, Sheridan is handing over the British crown. And there's Priestley handing over the Church of England. Uh, toast 14, the entire banquet next rose to toast the <laughs> dissolution of the German Empire. I like toast 14. Uh, replace that with a, a democratic republic. Toast 15, may the patriotic songs of the Légion Germanique soon become the favorite marching music of the British army. That's a nice touch. Finally, to 16, to universal peace, la paix universelle, founded on universal liberty. I should explain here, and I noticed there are one or two Kant uh, scholars in the audience, and of course Kant's essay, Perpetual Peace, uh, is the obvious reference point for this idea of perpetual peace in the late 18th century, but actually Kant's essay was preceded uh, and it's not as republican and certainly isn't as democratic as uh, earlier discussions of the idea of per perpetual peace amongst these radical enlightenment circles in the late 18th century. Now, of course, that sounds very utopian. How will mankind ever achieve um, universal peace? But actually, uh, when you read these writings, it's quite a sophisticated idea in a way, and it's hard not to have a certain sympathy for it because uh, the essence of it was that uh, if you could somehow get rid of all, not just all the kings and aristocrats, but get rid of the idea that what government is is the possession of vested interests that prey on the majority, if you could really establish a world in which all the societies were democratic, not just in the sense that they have constitutions which are supposed to be democratic, but in the sense that they are really uh, organized and conducted in the interest of the majority instead of on behalf of vested interest, if you could really do that, then there wouldn't be any more wars because all these democracies wouldn't fight each other because it's not in the interest of the majority of people to fight wars against neighboring countries. It's only in the interest of special vested interests who do this uh, for their own reasons. Uh, and therefore, uh, this talk about perpetual peace is not just eyewash. Uh, there's something to it. And it's a talk of perpetual peace which is completely inseparable with the idea that now the kings and aristocrats are finished and what we're going to do is establish uh, a, demo a genuinely democratic world. Well, uh, I'm coming to the end of the lecture, so I'm going to uh, skip a little bit and just uh, end by saying um, that this great banquet or English civic feast at Paris, as it was called, was widely reported in the British press, the Manchester Herald on the 1st of December, 1792, as well as in the London papers. And uh, the 13th toast caused the biggest uproar in London. Uh, and just after the declaration of war between Britain and France on the 12th of February, 1793, Edmund Burke, who was now the greatest apostle of conservatism and anti-democracy anywhere, read out the account of the Paris banquet uh, published in Bristow's paper in the, House, in the House of Commons, ferociously attacking Sheridan and others as collaborators with the French, uh, quoting the 13th toast, in particular the lines uh, to all the other patriots of England who by their writings and speeches have contributed to propagating the principles of the revolution, Priestley, Price, Sheridan, Barlow, Cooper, Took, and Mackintosh. Um, and Sheridan had to counter this in, in Parliament, uh, which he did by reading out a, a letter to him from John Oswald, published in Brissot's paper five days after the banquet, saying um, it, it didn't exactly say this letter that the toast had been cancelled, which uh, uh, Goodwin and some other historians have presumed, but rather that the uh, names of, prominent Whig, of the prominent Whig leaders like Fox, Sheridan, and Mackintosh were not actually cited in, in the toasts. And uh, uh, so, be that as it may, um, a torrent of invective was poured on the heads of these democratic radicals uh, in the British press. And there was a renewed upsurge of uh, mob anger, these church and king mobs, um, for, especially in uh, Manchester, for instance, 
um, they uh, destroyed the house of Thomas Cooper and really showed what the British public thought of these radical enlighteners and Democrats, or incendiaries, as they were frequently called in the press at that time, these, these incendiaries. Um, in reply, the British club prepared a political broadside dated Paris the 4th of December, some copies of which appear to have been posted up at night on walls in London, which is interesting. And the main substance of this broadside uh, we see here, um, and uh, so they explain what they're doing and try to justify what they're doing, and I just read the last sentence on this page. We declare that an equal government unmixed with any kind of exclusive privileges conducted by the whole body of the people or by their agents, chosen at frequent periods and subject to their recall, is the only government proper for man. And then they go on that the British and Irish nations do not enjoy such a government, that they cannot obtain it until a national convention be chosen and assembled to lay its foundations on the basis of the rights of man, that to effect this great and indispensable object we will use all the means which reason, argument, and the communication of information can supply, that we will endeavor to remove all national prejudices which it has been the interest of tyrants to excite in order to separate and enslave the great family of man, an allusion again to the perpetual peace idea, uh, and so on. So quite a moving document which ends, the text ends by saying here follow the signatures, but in the few surviving copies there aren't any signatures, though of course there were originally, and we assume that uh, uh, Tom Paine and all the other names that I've mentioned uh, were prominent among the list of signatories. So uh, it's time for me to end, and uh, that's the story of the British Club in Paris. And I'll just end with, because it gives, I think, something of the flavor of their uh, idealism, um, a characteristic stanza um, from uh, the ending, in fact, from her poem, uh, Helen Maria Williams' poem, The Bastille, um, A Vision. Uh, and there it is, philosophy, O oh, share the meed of freedom's noblest deed, tis thine each truth to scan, tis thine all human wrongs to heal, tis thine to love all nature's weal, to give our frail existence worth and shed a ray from heaven on earth. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Well, as the director mentioned, there's a little time for questions and discussion. So, yes, please. Ah, oh, there's a mic. Can you wait a second? So, if you wouldn't mind kindly passing that down. Thanks. Uh, in light of that, they were at that point overrunning Belgium, as you mentioned. I was wondering how did the radical Democrats square their um, idea of universal peace eventually with the uh, actual, like at the time, um, war with other countries like Belgium? Uh, well, I think the answer is that they began idealistically by saying we don't want to annex anyone or anything. Um, but after a short time, and after all, the Robespierre people um, took over quite quickly, and they certainly weren't interested in keeping promises of any sort. Uh, so they were quite happy to uh, annex everyone and, and everything. And uh, after Thermidor, and uh, in the late 1790s, something of, uh, and Helen Maria Williams in a way symbolizes that with her continued um, enthusiasm for the revolution, uh, and she remained in, in, in Paris later. Um, it does go back, uh, there were a few survivors. Louvet was one of the names I put on the board. He, he survived in hiding. And uh, the, in the late 1790s, something of the earlier successes of the revolution were restored, although in a very unstable and contested way, which, of course, uh, uh, allowed a gap which enabled Napoleon eventually to take over. But the um, discussions about whether it was lawful and right to uh, annex neighboring areas, which were very intense in 1792 and 1793, after a while, of course, were forgotten, and uh, expansionism and annexation became the order of the day. 
Uh, and uh, everyone else, of course, became more and more terrified of the French Revolution as it began gobbling up uh, neighboring areas. But in the early stages of the war, this was a very much a disputed point, and uh, Brito, for instance, uh, was opposed even to annexing uh, the um, area um, around Chambéry. I'm not sure what that department is called, Alp something, um, in, in, in France, but this area was part of Piedmont until um, 1792. It was overrun by the French uh, at, at this time, and uh, before the Rosphere takeover, many of the leaders, including Brissot, were opposed even to annexing this French-speaking area where there undoubtedly was a lot of support for annexation to France. Other questions? This may be a frivolous question, but what was the menu and what were the dishes <laughs> called? <laughs> I, it's, it's because, did they give these radical names to the dishes? Were they like I soup? <laughs> I, I don't think it's a frivolous question. I, I've, I've, not, I've read several of the press reports. Um, this, uh, my, my account is based on reports in a number of newspapers, uh, like the uh, Journal de, de Perlet, for instance, which is very detailed and interesting. Uh, daily, a uh, copy of which we have in the Princeton, in the Firestone Library, in the Rare Books collection. Uh, most, most great libraries don't have the Journal de Perfet, so it's marvelous that uh, we have a set here um, in, in Princeton. Um, I've not yet found the menu, <laughs> but if I do, I would like to, certainly like to communicate it to others, and I'm sure it will be very interesting. Oh, uh, the survivors were uh, all, I, I think, pretty uh, an antagonistic to, to Napoleon. And I should say that it's not only the survivors from this group, but there were some reinforcements after Thermidor, for instance, who, who, who adopt very much the same point of view. A very clear example of this, and I hadn't read his, this early pamphlet of his till very recently, would be the famous Swiss um, political thinker uh, Benjamin Constant. And Constant came to Paris soon after uh, Robespierre was overthrown in 1795. And his first political pamphlet, he's much more radical. He's no, remembered today, of course, as a great moderate who says one shouldn't be doctrinaire. If you want liberty, you've got to be moderate. Um, but this is not what uh, Constant was saying in his first pamphlet. What he says in his first pamphlet is we had democratic republicanism. All those guys around Brissot and Condorcet were 100% right. Nothing could be worse than Robespierre, who destroy is not the culmination but the destroyer of the revolution. And what we have to do is to get back to how it was before and forget about the horrors of, of, of the terror. Of course, later on, he, he, uh, he, he adopts a much more moderate position. But that was his position um, then. And uh, uh, Constant, again, like um, the other survivors, tend to be, um, uh, and, and most, indeed most of the, the British Democrats, I didn't mention Wordsworth and Shelley, but many famous literary people who weren't at the banquet but arrived soon afterwards, uh, were also part of this movement and very, very supportive of the kind of sentiments expressed, uh, but equally uh, very disillusioned, just like Beethoven, by... Uh, the pretensions and the kind of pseudo-social hierarchy, this new system uh, of imperial power uh, and authority and the, and the authoritarianism and the suppression. I mean, all these freedom of expression and freedom of speech in the press was one of the cardinal issues for all these people we've been talking about, with the exception only of John Oswald. Oswald broke with the Brissot faction and joined... Robespierre, because he was more interested in invading Britain than anything else, and he thought a more aggressive policy and a more, a more unified and disciplined policy would be possible under the Robespierreist. Um, but we don't know how his thoughts would have developed later because he was killed in a battle uh, in the Vendée, actually, in uh, 1793. A very interesting man, John Oswald, despite his support for Robespierre, because he was the loudest uh, publicist of vegetarianism at this period. And he'd, he'd, he'd acquired his vegetarianism in India, was much admired the Hindus, 
and uh, was, uh, as I mentioned, his feminism earlier on, and he was certainly was the most interesting figure. Um, but I don't know what he would have thought of Napoleon. Perhaps he'd have been more sympathetic. But the, the, the survivors were, were nearly all uh, very much opponents of Napoleon. Absolutely. Well, if, uh, like Helen Maria Williams, they uh, appeared on paper and in public as being critical of Robespierre and his friends, then they ended up in prison, which is what happened to her, and is what happened to Tom Paine. Uh, Paine, of course, was uh, thrown in prison uh, in the autumn of uh, 1793, uh, he became very dejected and very demoralized, suffered greatly from his imprisonment. Uh, the U.S. ambassador, of course, the, 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 in the depths of the terror, the only major state that still had relations with revolutionary France was the United States. And um, one reason, it's speculated that uh, why, why wasn't Payne uh, guillotined? Because he was very close to um, the Democratic Republican leaders who, who were guillotined by, by Robespierre. Um, so it's been conjectured that uh, they, they thought that this might not be good for relations between France and the only country with which France still had diplomatic relations, the United States. But actually, the US ambassador was so anti-democratic, this is Gouverneur Morris, who Payne suspected of being part of a conspiracy to try to trick the American people and to bring in, we, we can't have formal aristocracy in America, but we can have informal aristocracy if we just kind of, you know, pull the wool over people's eyes a bit. And this is what Payne thought Gouverneur Morris was doing, and Gouverneur Morris certainly didn't like Payne and his democratic ideas, and seems to have been very happy to leave him in prison. And even after uh, Robespierre was overthrown, um, the, uh, Morris was still <laughs> the US ambassador, and he didn't do anything to get him out. What, why Payne stayed in prison for another three months, I think till November 1793, he was a broken man, it had a terrible effect on him. Um, but uh, it, it, he, he wasn't uh, retrieved from prison till some uh, several months after after Robespierre's downfall. Uh, Helen Maria Williams was also in prison for quite a long time. Um, David Williams had uh, he, he was one of those the, the, the British club actually split in uh, w once the war with Britain began, there were those who said, well, now we have to support France and appeal to the British people not to support their government in this war. And this was too much for some of the club, which split actually in January 1793. David Williams is one of those that said, this we can't do, that we cannot appeal to the British government, uh, people against their government. Uh, and so he left and went back to Britain. So there was a division of opinion, uh, inevitably, in, in January 1793. But those that stayed in France and supported the revolution uh, were either imprisoned or uh, went to Switzerland, as Hereford Stone did, uh, or escaped in, or, or, or survived in, in hiding in one way or another. When they re-emerge, they are then um, once again very much supporters of the revolution in, in Paris, but they're... Uh, persona non grata in, in, uh, in Britain. Uh, Stone could never go back to Britain. Yes? Uh, wait, the mic is on its way. Yeah, in addition to the question on Napoleon, uh, CS wrote a constitution for Napoleon and he was in the club. Yes. So I think that... Uh, no, he wasn't, he wasn't one of the club. Yeah, but he was, he one, was, of the, he was one of those celebrated yeah, yeah, by yeah. the club. Yes. But he was also part of uh, many enterprises within and during the revolution, not to mention, of course, the role he had since the beginning. So he... The, the opinion on Napoleon perhaps was much more uh, complex. I mean, many, some of them were perhaps also in favour of Napoleon. Of Napoleon? Yeah. Well, uh, Sears was, yes. Um, well, Sears, as you say, was a very complicated character. Uh, he uh, was a materialist, an egalitarian, and a Democrat up to a point. But he was more of a quasi-Republican than a full Republican. He didn't want to get rid of the king as, as a figurehead. And uh, he had several disagreements, really, with the Brissot faction. 
And although he's so, Sears is such a central figure, certainly one of the leaders and one of those that made the revolution and the Declaration of the Rights of Man in 1789, but by 1792, he'd become uh, a rather isolated figure, I would say, who, and when it came to this tremendous struggle between those I call the uh, democratic republicans and the populist authoritarians, um, Sears withdrew into a kind of complete isolated neutrality uh, and didn't really take sides in this struggle. So he wasn't a target for the Robespierreists when they came to power, but he had to remove himself from the scene. So he, he reappears in revolutionary politics in the late 90s. I think he sincerely tried to help rebuild a real democratic republic in the late 1790s, but after a while, the instability and the intrigues and the conspiracies got so much on his nerves, he finally came to the conclusion that all this was um, impossible, and he did collaborate with Napoleon's uh, coup that brought Napoleon uh, to power and established the consulate in 1800, but I don't think he intended the kind of dictatorship that emerged. I, th I think he was deceived by Napoleon, but was rapidly kind of elbowed aside. Oh, there's a mic coming. Pardon? There's a mic. Did the British radicals make any reference to or comparison to the uh, revolution or failed revolution in the mid-17th century in England where certainly universal malehood suffrage was proposed at Putney. I'm not sure is the answer. I've not, not very conspicuously, but they may have done. And I have, as I say, I've only mainly seen um, uh, press reports, so account, accounts in French, which maybe omitted things that didn't seem terribly significant to, to the French at that moment. Um, so it's possible that they did. I'm not sure about that. Well, we can continue the discussion at the reception now, but let's thank Jonathan again for an extremely good <laughs>